is your time. But if you can look from one system to another, you would see time going very differently. Because depending upon gravity and velocity, the, those are biological changes, the expansion of the universe, the perception of time. Those changes will have you perceive time in a way that is very different. That's the legacy of Albert Einstein. It happens to be that there are billions, literally billions of locations in the universe where if you could put a clock at that location, it would tick so slowly that from our perspective, 15 billion years, if we could last that long, 15 billion years would go by, why it would take out six days. And those are the data. No one disputes them. The difficulty is these spaces are not necessarily relevant to the flow of time as the Bible sees it. The Talmud goes ahead in Hagiga and gets to this word day for day one, based on the first time that the d duration of a day is ex discussed, and says, he evoke yom achad, Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, there's evening and morning, day 1, and says, day 1, the duration of a day, 24 hours. The Talmud tells me that. Rashi, in his commentary on the Talmud, agrees, says, day, kuf dalad sha'ot, yom, day, 24 hours. Nachmanides on the sentence in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, I believe it is, the he or, and there was light. Nachmanides, the Kabbalist says, not, just that the day, not only that the days are 24 hours each, but the duration of the days, the six days of Genesis, is no more than the six days of our work week, made up of hours and minutes. So there are no ancient commentaries that say anything other than the fact that the days are 24 hours each. The Talmud says it, and it says it on day one. See, supposing it had said, but he had to be Yom HaShishi, on the sixth day. Well, then you could say, well, all the other days were different. You know, if the Talmud had used as the example, there's evening and morning the sixth day, we could say, well, the first five days were different. Okay? But the Talmud says it on day one. There's evening and morning day one. To let you know right from the beginning there's no monkey business going on here. The days are 24 hours each. There's no justification for any other comment. There are no ancient commentators that say anything other than that. Maimonides in the Guide for the Perplexed redefines, I count to 42 words, maybe there are more, but I count to 42 words in which Maimonides expands the meaning of these 42 words. One word he does not expand the meaning on is day. For Maimonides, he has no problem with day. All of the ancient commentators hold that the days are 24 hours each. But the Kabbalah, Nachmanides, where he says the days are, are 24 hours each as the days of our work week, expands the statement in Genesis and then later in the book of Exodus on on Kitikne Ebedivri and then in Leviticus on Shabbat Hashem. He says that although the days are 24 hours each, they contain kol yamot olam. They contain all the ages and all the secrets of the world. Nachmanides says the days are 24 hours each, but they contain all the ages and all the secrets of the world. And it took an Albert Einstein to figure out just how they could contain all the ages and all the secrets of the world. Einstein's laws of relativity were, let's say, presaged, we'll say, were predicted or were anticipated in Nachmanides' description of the early universe. There's only one Kabbalistic description of the physical universe, and here it is. Nachmanides brings it down very simply. He says, in the beginning, before the beginning, we don't, really, we don't know what there is. We can't tell what predates the universe. There's a medrash on that. The first word of the Bible in modern Hebrew is a bait, right? Bereshit, bait. And bait is written like a backward C. In other words, closed in all directions and only open in the forward directions. Hence, we can only know what predates, what, pre what comes after. We can never know what predates the Bible. And the hint is that the first letter of the Bible is closed in all directions and only open in the forward direction. Okay, so Nachmanides says we cannot know what predates the universe, but there was nothing that we can understand. And then suddenly, the entire creation was in a minuscule speck. He gives a dimension for the speck, something similar to the size of a grain of mustard. Okay? It's real tiny. And he says, that's the only physical creation. He says it three times in his commentary. There was one physical creation. 
There was no other physical creation. All other creations were spiritual. The nephesh is a spiritual creation, the soul of animal life. The neshama, the soul of human life, is a spiritual creation. There's only one physical creation, and that creation was in tiny speck. And it wasn't a speck in a vacuum, because a vacuum is space. The speck is all there was. Anything else was God. And in that speck was all the, the raw material that would be used for making the entire everything else. And he says, we don't have a word for that in Hebrew. And he describes the substance. He says it was, Luzado brings it down also in his, in his Kabbalistic works. The substance was dak ma'od, very thin, ein bo mamash, no substance to it. It was a substance without substance. And as this speck expanded out, stretching out, this substance so thin that it has no essence turned into matter as we know it. And he writes, Mishia Yeshit Fosposman. From the moment, moment that you have matter forming from this substanceless substance, time grabs a hold. It's Fospo, Tofes, grabs a hold. Not begins. Time is created at the beginning. Bereshi Bara Elohim at the Shema In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the creation. But time grabs a hold. The biblical clock starts when matter condenses, congeals, coalesces out of this substance so thin it has no essence. We only know one thing in the universe. One substanceless substance. A substance without substance that can change into matter. And that's energy. Einstein's famous equation, right? E equals mc squared tells us the relationship. That energy can change into matter. And once it changes into matter, time grabs a hold. And that's a phenomenal statement. Because I don't know if he knew the laws of relativity, but we know them now. That energy, like these light beams that you see, or, or radio waves or gamma rays or x-rays, all travel by definition at the speed of light, 300 million meters a second. And at the speed of light, time does not pass. The universe was aging, but time only grabs a hold when matter is present. This moment of time before the clock begins for the Bible lasted about one one hundred thousandth of a second. A minuscule time. But in that time, the universe expanded from a tiny speck to about the size of the solar system. And from that moment on, we have matter and time flows forward from that moment. And the clock begins here. Now, the fact that the Bible tells us there is evening and morning day one comes to teach us the biblical view of time, where time is being seen from. See, Einstein already taught us that time varies from place to place in the universe, and time varies from perspective to perspective in the universe. The Bible says there is evening and morning day one. Now, if the Torah was seeing time from Sinai out here sometime long after Adam, the text would not have written day one because by Sinai there had been millions of days had already passed. So there was a lot of time with which to compare day one. It would have said a first day. By the second day of Genesis, you could already say there was evening and morning a second day because there was already the first day with which to compare it. You can say on the second day, well, what happened on the first day? But you could not say on the first day what happens on the first day because first implies comparison in existing series. And there was no existing series. Day one was all that there was. Even if the Torah was seen time from Adam, the text would have said there was evening and morning at first day, because by its own statement there are six days. The Torah says there was evening and morning day one, we're taught, because the Torah is looking forward from the beginning. And it says, well, how old is the universe? Oh, Six days. We'll just take the time up to Adam. Six days. We look back in time and say the universe is 15 billion years old. But everyone in cosmology, everyone in science knows that when we say, or when I know when I say, the universe is about 15 billion years old, there's another half of the sentence that I never say, but everyone in the, in the profession knows what the other half of the sentence is. The universe is 15 billion years old as seen from the time-space coordinates that we exist in. And that's the key. That's Einstein's understanding of relativity. The Torah looks forward in time from very different time-space coordinates. When the universe was small, 
But in, it, since that time, it's expanded out. It expands out by stretching of space, and that stretching of space totally changes the concept of